Secretary of Agriculture and Senior Leadership in Rural Business Cooperative Service. I'd like to welcome you to this meeting. Uh, the Chief of Staff, Rural Development Cooperative Services, Stephanie Bizruki, uh, will also be providing some welcoming comments and a few additional words. And then the Deputy Administrator, Mark Brzezinski, Business Development Division, Andy Dramalowitz, and uh, Cooperative Development Branch Chief Jim Wadsworth will also uh, like to thank you for attending. Uh, the interagency working group on cooperative development first convened in uh, 2014 to meet a number of uh, lost my place and met a number of times over the several years to discuss cooperative development and the needs of the cooperative community and how federal government can further assist cooperatives and the cooperative development. Uh, Creating Food Economy Committee gives us the opportunity to highlight current issues in food systems and think about how cooperatives can address uh, access to healthy food and create a stronger rural uh, business community by building business relationships and awareness among government agencies and our public partners. Um, today, Stephanie Bezruki, uh, Chief of Staff of Rural Business Cooperative Service, will describe the purpose of the Food Economy Working Group and discuss how cooperative businesses can operate as an economic development tool. Then we're gonna hear from Lori Sapu, a guest speaker from the North Dakota Association of Rural Electric Cooperatives, and we'll describe how cooperatives can help people in rural food deserts. USDA Rural Development's Jeff Hudson will follow her with uh, a description and some key information about USDA, our Rural Business Cooperative Services resources available to help food and agricultural cooperatives. Then we'd like to open it up to comments, thoughts, and questions uh, from our other federal resources partners and that can help support the food economy and cooperative development in rural communities. We anticipate this meeting will also help develop a platform for sharing information on available government uh, and stakeholder programs and resources for a food economy. Um, we also would like to see it foster working relationships among the different government agencies and cooperative stakeholders to facilitate the uh, use of cooperative model for economic development uh, and the ability to address needs in their community. And then to continue to educate federal aid, federal and non-federal participants regarding the operation of cooperatives and the value of community development. This morning, our attendance consists of folks from USDA and other federal agencies and from various outside cooperative stakeholders. Because of the time constraint, what we would like is if you would introduce yourself in the chat, provide your contact information, and that will be uh, a way for us to keep track of who's participated. But then also if we have questions that we're unable to answer at the end, it'll give us a way to be able to address that. Um, and let's see. And now I would like to um, take some time to introduce USD Rural Development Cooperative Services uh, Chief of Staff Stephanie Bisruki. During the nearly seven years on Capitol Hill, Stephanie served as in a variety of leadership positions, including most recently as Legislative Director for Congresswoman Abby Finkenauer, and previously as Senator Senior Policy Advisor for Congresswoman Sherry Bustles. She holds a bachelor's degree from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Stephanie? Hey, thank you so much for that really kind introduction, Debbie, and, and good afternoon to everybody here. Thank you so much for attending this Food Economy Committee meeting. Um, I'm really happy to welcome so many of our federal and private sector partners and, and to describe the reason why we're here today. The 2014 Farm Bill authorized by the Secretary of Agriculture to chair this interagency working group. And it's about ensuring coordination on cooperative development among federal agencies and private sector organizations. At RBCS, we're honored to have an important and prominent role in through this working group and supporting cooperative development overall. I, and I know that we have a whole series of sessions, but I actually think this one is so important because this ties in so well with the work at the department that's going on right now around food systems transformation and new efforts to decrease consolidation in food and agriculture. Uh, cooperatives have been doing this for a long time. So I think it's so important that they continue to be front and center when we talk about how to improve the resiliency of our food supply chain. 
and I think Robert's got the slides for me, so I'll keep going. Um, cooperatives historic role in agriculture has only become more complex with time. Cooperatives are critical to the food supply chain. As you can see from the poster from one of our cooperative development grant recipients, all part they're all part of a system. This includes farmers, fishermen, marketing cooperatives, value added co-ops and co-ops that purchase farming inputs like seeds and equipment, as well as processors. Also part of the food system are cooperatives that warehouse and deliver food. This also means our financial cooperatives like banks and credit unions and mutual insurers. Um, as additional examples, this can also mean cooperatives that provide food to consumers. These are our farmers markets, our cooperative grocery stores, CSAs and worker owned restaurants. Um, even to just take it one step further, um, the cooperatives that bring broadband and electricity to rural America are necessary to the food supply chain. They keep equipment running, markets open, and during the COVID-19 pandemic, it became a way for farmers and consumers to connect with each other. What makes a cooperative a great development tool is the member patrons of the cooperative, which own, finance, use, and democratically control the cooperative. This group of people knows this better than any than anyone, that ownership of the cooperative allows its members to build wealth. And that wealth, it remains with the member patrons in the form of patronage refunds. The more a member uses a cooperative, the more patronage money the member receives. This money stays in the local community and it circulates where those members live. The democratic governance of the cooperative also has benefits individually for each member and for the community as a whole. Members who run the cooperative together, they learn business skills and they network with each other. These interactions overall improve capacity in that local community. I think it's also important to look closely at whether cooperatives qualify for federal programming. And cooperatives are excellent for community economic development, but it's easy to make a mistake and exclude cooperatives from federal programs. And that's due to the fact that not all cooperatives are the same. They really need to be looked at one by one. Um, as you know, cooperatives, they can vary by state and by entity. I, I know that one area of confusion often involves a cooperative's tax status. Generally, they take the form of corporations tacked under subchapter C of the IRS code, but some are taxed like partnerships and a few are exempt organizations. While C corporations are required to focus on delivering profits to their shareholders, cooperatives have multiple goals beyond just profits. This may include helping their members, employees, suppliers, community, other cooperatives, and, and even the environment. These are all goals I feel that align really closely with the priorities of this administration. Since cooperatives are democratic organizations, each member has a voice in how that business is run. This lets cooperatives produce creative solutions, especially in times of crisis, like we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for example, in the case of worker cooperatives, members can change their organization and even opt to take smaller paychecks rather than having to dismiss workers or go out of business. Uh, our farmers, we saw them change how they market and process their produce. And cooperative grocers, they can rely on relationships with locally sourced producers and other flexibilities to address supply chain challenges. We also saw cooperative retailers move quickly to take advantage of e-commerce. Uh, cooperatives, they also allow socially disadvantaged individuals and industries that have traditionally not paid well to work for themselves and to have more control over their earnings. So maybe if, if my colleagues will indulge me, I did want to tell a little story. Um, Last month, I visited the Bisman Community Food Co-op in Bismarck, North Dakota with Undersecretary Sir Chil Torres Small and my, my new friend, Lori, who you'll hear from later in this presentation. Uh, this co-op, this grocery store, it had received a grant through our Healthy Food Financing Initiative, which is another program at USDA Rural Development, and it offers grants for capital improvements to independent grocery stores that operate in underserved communities. So. It, Maybe I'll start by saying that this store was prettier than just about any Whole Foods I've ever been in. Um, it was gorgeous, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Um, I wanted to talk about the employees and the community members who, who came together to support that market 
and who actually joined us that day on site for a roundtable. Uh, out of all of the, the the discussion, I was actually really struck by a conversation that that I had off to the side with a younger woman who works there. And her job, she called herself the farmer wrangler. Uh, her job was to interface directly with the producers where they source their produce from. And it, they had this incredibly close connection between the store and the farm. And, and frankly, that's not something you see enough. But this woman, she knew all these farmers. She knew the ins and outs of their businesses. And I would have thought that she had lived there their whole life. But, but really, she, she told me she was a transplant to North Dakota. Uh, I wish I could remember where she was from, but I was really struck by it. And I, I said, why did you move to Bismarck, North Dakota? And she told me that she has a son with a disability and she needed to be somewhere where she had the support and he had the care that he needed. And she said the decision to move to Bismarck was such a good one because in Bismarck, she'd really found a community that opened its arms to her and to her family. Um, I thought that was really powerful because that speaks to the type of community, the, the network of people that surrounds cooperative businesses. Um, that's, that's the type of workplace where a, for a mom who works incredibly hard for her family and has a, the challenge of caring for a son with a disability. Um, and during that visit, everyone I met, everyone who participated in the round table was was very thoughtful and kind and, and really believed in the value that this cooperative brought to Bismarck and Mandan. Uh, there's lots of stories like this. So thank you for being here today to, to hear these stories, to share your own, and most importantly, to continue to collaborate with us at USDA about all the different ways to make sure stories are being told about the power of cooperatives, especially in food and agriculture. So, so thank you for joining us and, and listening to, to me give this, this brief cooperative 101 and to be able to share a story. I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jim Wadsworth, who will give a brief statistical review of agriculture cooperatives, resiliency, longevity, and economic impact on the food and fiber industry in the United States. So thank you, Jim, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you for that great story. Uh, I heard a little bit about that uh, food co-op, but not not the inside scoop, as you say. Uh, good afternoon and perhaps good morning to those further west. I also welcome everyone on this call for this interagency working group meeting on food and ag cooperatives. We're pleased that so many people have joined us. Thank you. And they're still popping in. I think we're at about 85 to 86 right now. I'm Jim Lodge of the Cooperative Services Branch, and today I'm going to spend just a few minutes going over some statistics on farmer cooperatives. A major branch function is to survey the population of agricultural cooperatives every year and report, report results. So here's the snapshot. And Robert, I think you need to back up. No, you're doing well. You got it right. You got it right. You got it right. I'm sorry. For 2020, our collection effort showed that there were 1,744 ag co-ops in the United States. These co-ops operate more than 9,500 locations across all 50 states. And that's one thing that we're trying to uh, in, increased data on is where are all these locations that the co-ops have. Uh, and they are owned by and serve about 1.69 million producers. But of course, some producers belong to more than one cooperative, so we are double counting in some instances. But many producers do belong to a cooperative, so we're really happy about that. For 2020, ag co-ops had total revenue of $201 billion, and they employed assets of $102 billion, which was a record. They also hit a record of $47 billion in member equity. Preliminarily for 2021, and these data will be released later in the fall, we are looking at a bit less than 1,720 co-ops. Every year we are seeing a number of drop due to merger activity, and unfortunately there are some dissolutions and uh, bankruptcies as well. But we're going to see a significant increase in business volume, likely to be a, around $230 billion. This will be the second most on record if that true it comes true. Total assets and member equity are both going to hit yet another record at about $110 billion in assets and $50 billion in equity. Ag co-ops employed 185,000 employees in 2020 and paid them wages and benefits of $11 billion. For 2021, it appears that co-ops are reporting up toward 200,000 employees, and it looks like co-ops will pay out somewhere north 
of $11.5 billion in wages and benefits. Co-ops had, had $8.3 billion in net earnings in 2020, which was also a record. It's looking like they will have net income of more than $9.5 billion for 2021. As we know, much of that money is returned to member owners as patrons refunds and retired or revolved equity, an important cooperative practice. So, as, so we can see that as a whole, ag co-ops are doing pretty well. Of course, in the population, there are some that are indeed struggling, a fact of any business sector though. But we also know that co-ops are resilient and long-standing businesses. Updating the figures that are shown on the slide, I did that yesterday, shows that 19% of ag co-ops are 100 years old or more, 55% are 75 years or old or more, and 78% are 50 years old or more. Indeed, co-ops are a time-tested business model, resilient and enduring. And finally, we just want to mention a few of the ag co-ops that most of you likely know of or heard of, Sunkiss, Land of Lakes, Florida's Natural, Ocean Spray, CHS Inc., Cabot, and there are many more, of course, and those are, those are naming the large ones. As we know, there are many, many small ones that have real impacts in their communities as well. Uh, next slide, Robert, please. This chart simply shows that even though the number of ag co-ops has trended downward since the high water mark in 1929, when there were 12,000 ag co-ops, the business conducted by them through the years on behalf of members has increased. People interested in our historical up to present aggregated statistics in Excel workbook format, you can reach out to us and we will send you that. We also have a current directory of ag co-ops, which has about 74% of those in our database because they have to opt in to the directory. But we're happy to share that too. Email us at co-opinfo at usda.gov or reach out to any single one of us in the branch. We also put out bulletins during the year, summarizing the statistics and other cooperative features, which you can receive by subscribing to Gov Delivery. And I'll put a link to Gov Delivery in our in our parts uh, in the chat in a minute. Uh, next slide, Robert. And as we've already heard, we have convened this meet meeting today to foster cooperative development and ensure coordination with federal agencies and national local cooperative organizations that have cooperative programs and interests and also individual people that have an interest in the cooperative model. We hope this group can seize the opportunity to make programs across the federal government better known and understood and bring people within and outside government together for greater synergy in cooperative development. We've created a federal cooperative resource webpage to facilitate cooperative development. We've gathered resources in a PDF file, but this is in the very beginning. We hope to expand this greatly, but we can easily update that PDF and add more and more uh, resources as we go forward. So we'll be reaching out to attendees and other federal partners to gather additional information for this resource. Now I will introduce our next speaker. We will now hear from Lori Sapu. Lori is a Rural Development Director for North Dakota Rural Electric and Telecommunications Development Center. Her projects have involved cooperative child care facilities, collectively owned meat processing plants, and recently a uh, solution to food deserts. Lori? Thank you, James. And that was very interesting information. That was great to hear. Go co-ops. Um, so the Rural Access Distribution Cooperative is an innovative approach for using the cooperative model to slightly disrupt the supply chain so that it can better serve rural places. As rural people have shown time and time again, when the free market isn't able to economically provide you with what you need, the chances are that a cooperative can. To give you some context, I'm going to start with the background, which led to our shared services cooperative that we had developed. Our cooperative development center is funded by a USDA rural cooperative development grant, and it's because of this consistent funding for technical assistance that we were able to accomplish this work. We have a trend in North Dakota. We are slowly moving from independently owned grocery stores to community owned cooperative and nonprofit models. We spend a lot of our time, energy and money on the transition of these independent stores so we can maintain local access to healthy food. It's necessary work that keeps our small towns ticking and well fed. But if you step out the side the box, you will see that we are just doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, as Albert Einstein might say. We are simply changing who the owners are and the burden of operating the store to a new tier of owners, ones that can absorb some losses with volunteers, donations, or tax bases. 
We're not solving key issues such as low volume and distribution. Many times issues like that cannot be solved individually because the population base is too small. Solving for this requires regional efforts that are really much higher, harder to organize. And it also involves bringing together businesses that traditionally compete with each other into a model where they work together for the benefit of their communities and their own businesses. Our journey started back in 2014. It's that year that we began receiving distress calls from rural grocers. They were looking for operating grants to cover shortfalls to, uh, or they were looking for grants to cover shortfalls or to replace failing equipment. It was really a sign that something was not working well. We began with research by engaging a group of rural grocers and resource providers in a task force to address the challenges. We, we received a $10,000 grant from the Bush Foundation to engage grocers in the in the state in a survey to analyze those results and to bring them together to learn of the findings. So some of our key findings, those findings that set the stage for the Rural Access Distribution Cooperative were, first of all, that um, we are just so dang small. And it really didn't register with me until I put it into a graph. In 2016, the time that we actually began some solid planning for this, the average U.S. grocery store had a weekly sales volume of $320,000. For the similar time frame, the average rural grocery store in North Dakota had a weekly sales volume of $20,000. And this is significant because we know suppliers are looking for larger, fewer stops that are closer together. And we know, too, that they struggle as they continue to lose market share to non-traditional grocery retailers such as Walmart, Target, or Costco. We were also surprised by the number of trucks that supply a store, even a small one ranging from seven to 30 per month. And as you know, each truck comes with a delivery fee that's sometimes hidden in the cost of goods. There is a separate delivery truck for bread, milk, meat, pizza, chips, and these really deliver very small volumes of product. We identified the primary supplier for each store and then plotted them on a map. And as you can see, it was obvious that the routes were not necessarily based on efficiency. Our assumption is that it was based primarily on volume. We received a second grant from an anonymous nonprofit to contract with Upper, Plate, Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute to have them do a simple optimization of the routes. By streamlining routes, we learned that there could be an annual savings of $385,000 in transportation. And this is just for the primary supplier. Back when the cost of diesel was $3 per gallon and you could find a truck driver. Not being from the grocery industry, I found a few more things surprising. For example, a lot of our small grocers drive to urban centers for products that they have trouble getting through their main suppliers. They can't get the product in low volumes or the wholesale cost is actually larger to them than the cost of the retail at the urban box, big box store. And the midpoint net profit margins in North Dakota were really, really low. In 2016, it was $18,200. No wonder our small grocers were tired. This isn't enough uh, margin to maintain a grocery store. They had freezers and coolers that were failing, as well as their HVAC systems being outdated. Um, this uh, with this, they couldn't even afford to step into more modern technology to compete. And so while we were gathering the data, we witnessed a sharp trend. We started with 137 rural grocery stores in towns of less than 2,100 people in 2014, and we now have roughly 100 remaining. The, the decline has slowed. COVID has helped reinvigorate some of that local shopping, but the calls for help are starting to come in again. There's still a movement towards uh, transitioning to community owned when the store comes up for sale, and more than 20% of our stores are now some sort of nonprofit. So these were the factors that led to our decision that something needed to change, something more than ownership. Our advantage in turning these challenges into opportunities was being a consistently funded cooperative development center. We've gained experience in cooperative theories and developing innovative ways to use the model to address our challenges. 
we secured grant funding through CoBank to conduct a second survey where we tested for elements of cooperation. We searched for signals indicating where people were willing to cooperate. For example, do stores in the region already work together? Are there any community-owned stores in the region? Has the community lost their store and are the residents there trying to revive it? Or do any stores in the region suggest they would have spare capacity for warehousing? Or are any stores interested in working together? We were lucky. Roughly 3% of the population can be considered risk takers. Those people who are willing to take on a challenge or make a change. Out of those 100 remaining rural grocery stores, a grocer in Walsh County in Park River, a town of 1,350 people showed up as a risk taker. It's how we landed our pilot project in Walsh County. The grocer indicated on the survey that she had backroom space at her store that could be used for aggregating products and was interested in working with other stores. There were three grocers in that area that had already been sharing inventory when others were short. There was a community effort to revive a closed store and there was a community owned store. Adding to our luck, two other grocers in Walsh County emerged as what we call early adopters, another rare human characteristic. About 14% of the population are early adopters. One was in Hoople, a town of 225 people, and one in Edinburgh, a town of 180 people. Our Cooperative Development Center approached these three grocers with an opportunity to participate in a pilot project, initially coined as a redistribution hub. We used the funding from CoBank to develop a financial feasibility model. By comparing invoices among three stores, we determined there was an average of 15% difference in the cost of wholesale food for stores just 15 miles from each other, simply based on volume. It showed we could aggregate, sort, and distribute products from the conventional supplier and glean a $10,000 profit per location after paying for the sorting and distribution. This was from just one supplier. The savings could increase should we aggregate products from more than one. We then added a community without access, without local access to healthy foods, Fordville, a town of about 280 people. At this location, we approached a restaurant owner about the possibility of installing climate controlled grocery lockers connected to a local online shopping platform for the benefit of the people living there. So this got us to a four point hub. Our steering committee emerged with the incorporation of a shared services cooperative that has a mission to improve local access to healthy foods and locally retailed and produced products in their region. Their objectives were to purchase together to decrease wholesale costs, to aggregate products from different suppliers for transportation efficiencies, to provide a local online shopping and delivery option for added convenience, and to service climate controlled grocery lockers to provide access to healthy foods for communities in their service area that do not have a grocery store. As many of you probably know, a shared services cooperative provides a mechanism to buy or provide products or services for members at a total cost less than the combined cost of individual members buying or providing for themselves. Savings are captured in this case through shared administrative costs volume discounts, and reduced delivery and transportation costs through the aggregation of products. The members patronage is through the use of the cooperative services. Once we had the green light on that financial feasibility, our Cooperative Development Center worked to secure grant funding for the pilot project, raising a total of $350,000 from the Bush Foundation, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Caring Foundation, an anonymous donor, and local supporters. The funds we raised were used for legal fees, a climate controlled box truck, two grocery locker systems, development of the online shopping platform, integration of the platform to the lockers and startup staffing. This has emerged as a community based cooperative that is striving to operate at cost to maintain affordable access to products in their region. It's taken us a few years to get to this spot and we're not quite finished implementing the plan. The grocers are now purchasing cooperatively. It took quite a bit of up upfront work to develop a new system with the primary supplier that we have referred to as sister accounts, 
allowing the two smaller stores to access the supplier even though they are under their volume minimum. Not only is this increasing volume for the better wholesale price, but it's improving variety and quality too, especially with produce and dairy. These small stores can now split cases so they can keep their inventory at a level where it is um, where it can be sold while it is still fresh. Our center used media channels a lot to make people aware of our issue and our work that we are doing to change the system. Through this, Stanford University heard about the project and reached out to connect us with an IT company out of Texas called FTS. FTS agreed to modify their online shopping platform using the cooperative as their customer, but programming the platform to serve all three grocery stores for the price of one. And this was a huge win for us. As you know, the main reason rural struggles to implement online shopping is price. The platform is the same cost for a small store as it would be for a large urban store. The online shopping goes live next week, so we're excited about that. Uh, we also installed new point of sale systems for the two smaller stores so that inventories can talk with each other. And why not, since this is a pilot project, continue to test the value of technology in rural areas. How can we get back some of those sales from large urban retailers? We hooked up with T4 Solutions, a company that provides climate controlled grocery lockers and have integrated the lockers with the cooperative's online shopping platform. With these lockers, customers order online through their local grocery store. The store then shops and delivers the product to the grocery lockers, which hold the food behind ambient, refrigerated, and frozen doors. The customer receives a text or email message when the order has been delivered, giving them a code. They go to the lockers, they enter the code. The doors of the lockers where their product is stored pop open. Once the order is picked up, the grocer receives notification that the uh, transaction is complete. The temperature is monitored by a third party and the cooperative 24 seven. In addition to Fordville, we've installed the locker system in Park River outside that, that hub store which is the larger town, as a demonstration site to help people learn more about them, hopefully helping us grow sites and the use of the lockers. The lockers are installed and waiting for integration with that online shopping platform. We knew that we had supply chain problems prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic accelerated the issue for our state. It certainly presented challenges in rolling out this project, but it also presented opportunities to prove the value of a local diverse hubbing system. During the pandemic, the cooperative was able to pick up the slack where the supply chain was failing us. For example, 104 of North Dakota's 203 school districts lost their wholesale food supplier for the school lunch program last year. Three of those school districts were in the co-op service area and the co-op was able to step up and supply their food. Also, we lost two major milk suppliers in the region. The co-op has filled that gap as well. These customers now help pay for the movement of that truck. Through the media, others learned of the, of the project. A local potato producer is now moving his produce through the cooperative to the local stores. And there's a bakery that's becoming a member of the cooperative and will be a bread supplier to the schools beginning this fall. We have other communities waiting to see how it works and interested in learning more. The co-op has chosen to operate as cost. By choosing this route, others followed. So there's a trucking company that drives the truck at a reduced cost because they want to do that for their community. They want to help them. Businesses are buying annual advertising on the truck to defray the costs of operating. And the local food council is seeking ways to partner their food distribution with the cooperative. Equal access to healthy food is something that a lot of people care a lot about. The power of this project was the data we help with, that we gathered to help people make decisions. The key to financial sustainability of the cooperative is volume and aggregation. The intent has always been to develop a path that others can follow and just share what we have been learning. This would not have been possible without the consistently funded cooperative development center that has had an opportunity to gain experience in both elements of human cooperation and the cooperative business model. So many thanks to USDA for their funding. Thank you for your time.
Thank you so much, Lori. And I now want to take uh, a little bit of a turn and introduce Jeff Hudson. Uh, he is with the Public Private Partnership Branch of Rural Business Cooperative Services, and he's the primary contact for the Sud Food Supply Chain uh, Guaranteed Loan Program. Jeff? Yes, Debbie decided to take the first line out of my script. So I'll have to go from here and hope I don't die. Um, greetings, everybody, and thanks for the introduction, Debbie. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to present on the Food Supply Chain Guaranteed Loan Program, and then I'm going to briefly mention the Meat and Poultry Expansion Program and the Meat and Poultry Intermediate Intermediary Lending Repro, uh, Program. Um, this is going to be a very high-level view of the programs. Uh, additional uh, information is available on the respective program websites. So as we talk, and what we're really talking about here is part of the food system transformation that this administration has undertook uh, with funding through the American Rescue Plan Act. And the food supply chain um, was really um, the, first, the first program to roll out of uh, the funding from the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, the food supply chain guaranteed loan program will provide about $1.4 billion in loan guarantees uh, to lenders. The middle point here is probably the key one. The FS the food supply chain will facilitate financing to qualified borrowers and projects for activities in the middle of the food supply chain, particularly aggregation, processing, manufacturing, storage, transportation, wholesaling, or distribution of food. Um, must be a startup or expansion project. Um, again, the purpose of the food supply chain program is to increase capacity and help create a more resilient, diverse, and secure U.S. Uh, food supply chain. Next slide, please. Um, again, uh, we're looking to expand access to financing for food systems, uh, infrastructure, um, increase capacity and help create a more resilient, div diverse, and secure food supply chain, uh, support the department's fiscal year 2022 departmental priority of creating a more and better market opportunities. Uh, the food system of the future needs to be fair, competitive, distributed, and resilient. And as I mentioned earlier, this was a pilot program coming out of Section 1001 of the uh, American Rescue Plan uh, Act of 2021. Next slide, please. Um, governance on the program, I, I think these slides are going to be available to you, was a federal register notice on December 9th of 2021. And we also have our website address there, which encapsulates and captures or captures a lot of the program information that's needed. Next slide, please. Um, the program is going to uh, provide, can do a maximum of $40 million to one borrower. Uh, it's either an 80% or 90% guarantee of loss to the lender. Uh, to be qualified for the 90% guarantee, the lender needs to provide a fixed interest rate for the full term of the loan equal to or less than prime plus two at the time the guaranteed loan is closed. Interest rates are negotiated by the lender and the borrower. Uh, loan terms may not exceed 40 years. There's provisions for this in our, in our notice of funding opportunity and likely you're not going to see a lot of loan terms that are going to exceed 30 years. Next slide, please. Um, the the program, as I mentioned earlier, will support about 1.4 million in loan guarantees. Uh, to date, we've approved three loans for a total of 36 million, and the program has a pipeline of about 310 million dollars in applications as we're sitting today. Uh, again, the applications are submitted by commercial lenders to USDA and are subject to the lender completing their uh, loan underwriting and approval of the loan. All rural areas and urban communities anywhere in the United States or territories are eligible as there are no geographic restrictions. This is a big difference from a lot of our other programs that we operate. We are, we are able to guarantee credit in urban areas. And probably the big part of this program is there are no guarantee fees or annual renewal fees to the lender or to the borrower. Um, when I was putting this together, uh, I'm working with one bank right now. Uh, with, with a bank that is in the process of developing a $40 million application uh, for a uh, grower-owned vegetable processing cooperative uh, in the Midwest. We're anticipating to see that loan application hit here within the probably the next month or so. So we do have cooperatives that are showing an interest in this program, and cooperatives are definitely an eligible entity uh, for the food supply chain program. Next slide, please. Um, uh, for the food supply program, uh, contact information, you've got two different ways of getting there. We have a, a mailbox, that's the RD food supply chain loans at USDA.gov, 
or you can come right to me at jeff.hudson at usda.gov. Uh, I am the person that is covering the uh, program email box. Um, so I, I am the primary contact for the food supply chain program. Next slide. The meat and poultry processing expansion program um, has has been in phase one or round one was announced. MPEP, as, or as we call this program, MPEP, MPEP 2 is to be announced. Uh, second round funding request is under development and should be released, uh, released later this year. Um, the reference to the website is for the first round of applications. These applications are in process of being reviewed with award announcements expected, uh, we'd hope, by the end of September. And again, the website will be updated uh, when the next uh, request for award is announced. Next slide, please. Um, again, as we talk about the website, uh, this is, the website is, will have the, the FAQs, uh, request for application. Uh, there's a template there uh, for the program. Again, this is for the first round. That template will likely change in the second round because the program is going to be revised in the second round. Um, all, grant, all applications in the, in, in the MPEP program are being accepted through grants.gov. have to be submitted electronically. Um, it provides some program resources, non-USDA contacts for technical information, and notice and registration for upcoming stakeholder webinar events. Next slide, please. The Meat and Poultry Intermediary Lending Program uh, first, round, first round applications. We'll go to the next slide, please. Yeah, that's where, okay. The first round applications are due on Monday. Uh, I'll get to this in a second. Um, as we take a look at the food transformation that we've had under this administration, um, we started with the Meat and Poultry Technical Assistance Program, the Meat and Poultry Inspection Readiness Grant, uh, the Meat and Poultry uh, Processing Expansion Program, the Food Supply Chain Guaranteed Loan Program, and now we have the Intermediary Relending Program. And again, these are all building uh, on one another uh, and trying to provide assistance uh, in the meat and, uh, meat and poultry arena to start with. Uh, the Meat and Poultry Intermediary, Intermediary Relending Program will have the ability to do the same thing the Food Supply Chain Guaranteed Loan Program does once the funds revolve. Next slide, please. Again, this, this just gives some highlights between the food, uh, food Supply Chain Guaranteed Loan Program and the MPILP program. Um, there's, again, as you can see, there's uh, lim over lim uh, overlaps there, um, but they, they also can work in tandem. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. And again, this is covering the, the, some of the different uses, borrowers, funds, um, to there, and then we should have one more slide, I believe. Um, minimum award in the uh, MPILP is five hundred thousand um, dollars. Maximum award uh, is uh, up to fifteen million dollars, and the across the two cycles, as I mentioned, first round of applications are due on Monday. And I'm not presenting this for anybody to try to get an application on Monday, but there will be a second round of applications that are due December thirty first, two thousand twenty two. We're hoping to award the first rounds by the end of September. And then again, at the end of February, uh, we're looking for the grant to be drawn down and obligated within three years of the date of, of receipt. The eligible applicant for this program are uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, tribal organizations, public bodies, and cooperative lenders. Um, so again, your farm credit system would be uh, eligible under credit unions could be an eligible applicant for this program. Um, that really concludes uh, a high level overview on the three programs that we're running through rural business cooperative services uh, that are supporting um, the food supply chain. And the web, again, the website is there for the meat and poultry intermediary lending program. And I will be around as we conclude here to field any questions if there are any. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that overview of the food chain programs. And uh, now at this point, I want to take a moment and introduce Matthew Busby. Matt serves as the Vice President of Operations overseeing NCBA CLUSA's development programs in the U.S. and overseas. He has 30 years of experience in organizational development, strategic planning, and capacity building 
as well as overseeing a portfolio of projects operating in the US, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia. Matt? Thank you, Debbie. Uh, the National Cooperative Business Association is proud to support this interagency working group. For over 60 years, NCBA has partnered with the U.S. Agency for International Development and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to strengthen food systems and value chains around the world. As noted today, cooperatives are uniquely positioned to build strong value chains as they are present at every stage. NCB, NCBA believes that co-ops with market facilitation and value chain development provide the most effective and sustainable results to create economic opportunities and build community resilience. NCBA is also excited about our most recent partnership with USDA. As part of the American Rescue Plan, USDA is supporting historically underserved communities across our nation. Through our membership and networks, NCBA will work with farmers, ranchers, and foresters in these communities to support co-op capacity and increase education and training. We will also increase awareness and connections to the many programs and services of USDA to these communities. Thank you to USDA and all the other federal agencies for supporting cooperatives. Your continued support and work are critical, and NCBA is honored to be a part of your efforts. Thank you. Debbie? Thanks, Matt. Um, I, at this point, want to uh, turn to our federal partners and would like to uh, give them an opportunity to talk about resources or financial information or financial resources that might be available, uh, whether that's research or connections to other stakeholders, as we described. And the, the food economy is broad and encompasses many types of cooperatives. Um, so I want to give the the partners that we know are on the line a chance to. Um, talk about any resources that might be available through them. Uh, the first that I would like to talk um, call call on is uh, Nancy Gilbert from EDA. Are you on Nancy? I am and just turning on my camera. Thank you um, so much for this opportunity to uh, be part of this presentation. I think we have been um, engaged as a partner with USDA uh, with regard to the co-ops for several years since I've been at EDA anyways, and um, I'm happy to be here to share some resources. One of which I would um, highlight is a collaborative effort that we recently completed with USDA Rural Development and the Innovation Center partners that we have there uh, in putting together a guide to uh, economic development resources that complement each other at uh, EDA and USDA Rural Development. And I'll drop a link to that in the chat. Um, that was, I think, a fruitful um, bringing together uh, of uh, our respective resources to show uh, recipients, applicants, how they might uh, even and blend together uh, these resources to do some of the projects that um, take a continuum of time to complete. So uh, featured in that um, guide are our core economic development support programs, which is our economic adjustment assistance and public works programs. Um, those are sort of our um, bread and butter, our core at um, economic development administration, and they can, uh, especially the economic adjustment assistance or EAA program can fund a variety of um, assistance from RLF programming uh, to capitalize those RLF programs that can provide loans and support for cooperative businesses to other projects that can help provide those conditions or infrastructure that can really support some of the work that's being done uh, in many of these areas. And we have done uh, meat processing centers. We have done um, a number of really creative um, agricultural economic development related activities, whether they're sort of looking at uh, drones uh, to, to help work uh, those agricultural areas and, and uh, provide some information technology there, as well as as now EDA is moving more into providing um, workforce development assistance for upskilling uh, uh, people in these areas uh, to provide a, a clear workforce for the kind of work that you all are doing. So um, in addition to that, of course, um, the foundation 
of the work that EDA does is the work that we do through our um, almost 400 economic development district organizations across the country that prepare their comprehensive economic development strategies. And that's a fantastic way to make sure that the needs and interests of the cooperative businesses um, are represented in those regional economic development plans so that when um, investment decisions are made as a whole in those jurisdictions, um, they're certainly serving the needs and interests of the communities um, that we're talking about here today. So I can leave it there. I'll certainly drop that um, guide into the chat, although I know you probably are all familiar with it, but happy to add anything or, or answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you, Nancy. Um, I would next like to call on uh, Kevin Natz from the National uh, Cooperative Farmer, or National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, NCFC. Kevin, are you on? Hi, Debbie, I, I am. I, I wasn't aware that I'd be called on today. Um, so I, I'm not sure I have much to contribute except other than our, we, we have a number of members who are very interested in what kind of grant programs there might be uh, throughout the government that have largely been uh, uh, provided through the various uh, programs that were passed in the last couple of years. So having some sort of central uh, information database, I don't know if database is quite the right uh, terminology, but what, what you're all doing to pull some of that together to see what programs are available and outside of the traditional programs that we already know about will be very helpful moving forward uh, for our folks because I've, I've recently had a number of folks ask, ask those questions. Great, I'm glad to hear this is gonna be a good resource for you to use. Um, I guess the next person that I'd like to uh, tap is Josiah Griffin from the Office of the Secretary, uh, Office of Tribal Relations. Josiah. Thank you. So aloha makaku. My name is Josiah Griffin. I work under the leadership of Heather Don Thompson, a political appointee in the Office of Tribal Relations and the Office of the Secretary. So our role is to really work across USDA. Um, we analyze every significant rule that is circulated throughout the department for tribal implications. To, to, to determine whether consultation needs to occur under Executive Order 13175 with tribal governments. And in that vein, we are also heavily engaged with rural development and the Agricultural Marketing Service on uh, new and upcoming programs that are available through the American Rescue Plan and through other authorizations to support um, food system resilience. Uh, many of the the needs and considerations that we see in you know, working with tribal communities also relate back to how the department is looking to engage and um, support the food systems and food economies of other underserved communities. And so I'm very happy to be part of this conversation and I'm glad that conversations like this interagency working group are ongoing. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Josiah, I'm glad you're here. Um, the next person I would like to tap is Christine Connell from the Deputy Director for AMS. Hi everyone, good to talk to you today. Yeah, I kind of echoing what everyone has said where I'm excited to learn more about all the different cooperative programs that are uh, going on. I've been leading an effort um, around the regional food business centers that we're hoping to launch in the next month or so. And we'll uh, definitely um, have opportunities for cooperatives to be engaged uh, through, through that program. So thanks so much for um, sharing all these resources today. Thank you. Um, and then uh, from the Food and Nutrition Service, Senior Program Specialist, Geraldine Nunu, are you on? I am on, thank you. Oh, let me turn up this little fan here. Maybe you can hear me a little bit better. Um, yeah, I'm excited to hear more about what is going on in this group and um, the things that have been shared today have been very fascinating, so thank you. Thanks. Um, and then another uh, agent or another federal partner that we've been working with on different projects, Sarah Campbell from the Beginning Farmers uh, Project.
Are you on, Sarah? Okay, we'll come back. Um, next person I want to give the opportunity to talk is from NAS. He's a census administrator, Nate Vandermeer. Okay. Nate, are you on? Okay, I'm two for two. <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to move down to the director of program operations from FSA, Linda Cronin. OK, I'd like to give a lot of other, a lot of people the opportunity, so if you don't respond real quickly, I will go ahead and move on down the list. And if you feel that you have more to add and I've missed you, please put that in the chat and they will tap me and let me know. Uh, Vanessa Gordon from ARS. Would you like to have would you like to add anything to the conversation? OK, hearing nothing, I'm going to move on to Christine Sorensen from Rural Development. She's a community economic development specialist. OK. Uh, we'll move on to NRCS. Liz Champs or Liz Camps. My apologies. OK, M moving to AMS, Jeffrey Davis. OK, uh, FPAC and NRCS, Jose Jimenez. Are you available? Hi, everybody. This is Megan Moriarty. I was wondering if um, anybody just wants to jump in. Yeah, that <laughs> might be the easier way to do that. Could be, you know, private sector or, or some of our partners. I think we have people from SBA um, on, which is wonderful, and uh, the Veterans Administration. I think we have some EPA folks on. Um, we'd just love to hear from you. Looks um, like uh, Leslie Glover. Yeah, Leslie. Yeah, just quickly, this is actually my first time uh, to be in on the discussion. I'm actually from the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production, and that may be a strange combination to to think of, but actually we're really excited uh, about one of the presentations earlier to hear that there is a nexus obviously between what's going on in urban environments and the rural environments. And to the secretary's point, I've heard him say it on a number of occasions, we're certainly not looking to pit communities against each other. What we're trying to do is bring communities together really through agriculture. We all love to eat. We all love food and everything uh, centered around it. And so to the extent that we can continue to uh, bring earl, urban and rural communities together. Uh, we're looking to do that. So again, I don't have a lot in terms uh, of things to add yet since this is my first uh, discussion, uh, but we're certainly looking forward to, to find ways that we can partner and, and, and collaborate as we go further. We do have a couple of uh, funding opportunities that are out there. Um, and there's there's not an explicit overlap in terms of uh, of who are who is eligible, even though we do try to work with some of the tribal communities. So it was good to hear you know some of the discussions about uh, food deserts in rural areas because some of those tribal communities fit fit that overlap because there's some uh, overlap in terms of the density uh, that they have in some of those communities. So anyway, there is some overlap out there. We have two funding opportunities. One of them is the composting and food waste reduction uh, agreements. Uh, those are for municipalities. Uh, and then we also have the urban ag and innovative production competitive grants that are out there. And I'll put the links at the, in the chat just so you all can be aware of, of, of what's out there and looking forward to the collaboration. Great, thanks Leslie. Um, I see a couple of hands and I'm going to do them in the order that I saw them. Sarah Hernandez from AMS. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm not going to turn my camera on because I'm not camera ready today, but I'll be a disembodied voice. Um, my name is Sarah Hernandez. I'm with the Agricultural Marketing Services Livestock and Poultry Program. And um, a few slides back when, when Jeff was speaking, he showed a visual that showed the meat and poultry processing 
um, expansion initiatives that are going on. It's about $1 billion worth of programs that are going through um, you know, various uh, par partnerships between rural development and AMS and National Institute of Food and Ag. Um, and uh, he mentioned one of them, the Meat and Poultry Processing Technical Assistance Program. We've established a network of technical assistance providers to provide um, that kind of support, um, kind of wraparound support for uh, businesses, projects, cooperatives, <laughs> what have you, who are working in the in, in the um, you know, in the space of expanding capacity for that middle supply chain. Um, and this technical assistance is pretty broad scoped. Um, everything from uh, pre-award grant application process, you know, and uh, assisting them first time, especially first time uh, grant applicants, all the way through uh, business planning, financial planning. Um, we have a significant amount of technical expertise in the meat and poultry processing operational area. Uh, from food safety to designing cold storage and what have you and distribution. Um, and then expanding beyond that, really tech, providing technical assistance through this network to help with supply chain development, making connections between those areas of the supply chain to really um, you know, get at this idea of building the, the, the um, food systems transformation from, uh, from the bottom up and the middle out to you know, not only urban, uh, not only rural, but urban areas as well and all across the country. So I appreciate the opportunity to just join you today, kind of throw that program out there. I'm always looking for opportunities to connect our technical assistance network with other organizations that are supporting these types of projects and initiatives. Um, and so please do reach out to me if you are interested in learning more. Um, and certainly if you are aware of a project, a cooperative project that is working in the space, you know, with livestock producers to develop a cooperative um, for processing um, or, you know, distribution or aggregation. Um, I would certainly love to hear from you and connect you with this technical assistance network. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, next hand I saw was Susan Perry from NRCS. Yes, it sounded like NRCS wasn't representative, represented, so I will just speak up um, as part of local regional uh, working group, which uh, I see Juliana is going to speak next. It's a wonderful working group I've been involved in for many years. And to what uh, the, the last speaker just said, uh, we have our first uh, Allegheny grass-fed beef cooperative in Pennsylvania, just formed, just doing their inaugural sales event in Pennsylvania. So that's exciting and certainly our focus is always conservation on the land and helping farmers to support their um, conservation efforts as well as um, I'm the state grassland conservationist. So certainly uh, my interest is helping them market their products. So I think uh, it'd be interesting to have a call with, uh, I saw your last name was Hernandez. I didn't catch it first, but I may, Amy, I think it was. I may Sarah. reach out to you because uh, they are looking for ongoing support and technical assistance for this first time effort in Pennsylvania. So I just wanted to mention that. And as part of the working group, we're always looking to support cooperative development and anything we can do to connect urban and, and rural ag to uh, consumers. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, next uh, is Juliana Arnett from AMS and the local regional food working group. I don't think I have too much to add. I think Susan did a great job and I'll kind of follow up on my colleague's comments earlier. So I am Juliana Arnett. I'm with the USDA Agriculture Marketing Service. Um, I also support our interagency systems working. Just wanted to recognize that cooperatives have played, you know, such an important um, role in this space as Stephanie mentioned in her opening comments. Uh, we at AMS have a number of resources that I think are really applicable that could be used um, for this, including our grant programming, grant programming such as the Farmers Market Promotion Program, Promotion Program, and Regional Ship Grants. For the Farmers Market Promotion Program and Local Food Promotion Program, these are our grants that can be used to help, you know, group of farmers markets and also uh, other entities that are thinking about how to really address kind of common distribution issues and how to get local food to those distribution systems as well as our regional food system partnership grant really focuses on communities coming together to plan around these and we know that you know cooperatives are really invested often in this and also these are really good tools to help fund um, the planning the organizing and 
should work as well. So just wanted to mention those. And I will say we also have other resources that people may not be as familiar with, our local group directories and our wholesale market and facility design and technical assistance program, which Christina actually leads, and they can provide technical support to stakeholders, um, you know, working on design of construction and remodeling related to food markets, including uh, food hubs. So just wanted to mention that, and I will put a couple links in the chat, including um, the document I think a lot of people are probably with, the uh, USDA. Thanks for this opportunity and really excited about all of the things that you've mentioned and part of this discussion. Thanks, Juliana, and, and thanks for putting the uh, link to the resource in the chat. I think that'd be very helpful for a lot of folks. Um, and next is Vanessa McKinney. Hi, everyone. Yeah. I'm Vanessa McKinney with EPA's AgStar program. I'm very um, pleased to have worked with um, James Bodsworth, one of the, the earlier presenters, and um, spreading the word about the EPA AgStar program, which is a cooperative program with USDA rural development. Um, we provide resources for farms with a livestock manure management um, technique called anaerobic digestion. And anaerobic digestion is a way to um, safely handle manure and generate revenue um, by selling energy, um, consumer products, and creating fertilizer. Um, I just wanted to uh, you know, tell everyone a little bit more about the AgStar program for your awareness as um, we have worked with farmer cooperatives in this space in the past and know that oftentimes consumers are looking out for products that are um, providing that additional environmental benefit as well as local energy resources fertilizer or other um, locally made products that farmers might be able to sell from these systems um, so i'll drop a link to the agstar program in the chat and um, please feel free to contact me as well i'll put my email address there as well thanks Great, thanks, Vanessa. Um, Kim Anderson. Hello, I am Kimberly Anderson. I am the Deputy National Director for Nutrition and Food Services at VHA. And first, I wanted to say thank you for including us. And this is my first call, just like Leslie said, so I don't have too much to offer. Um, but we are in our infancy of creating a food security office under Nutrition and Food Services. And as I was listening to the presentations, I was thinking, wow, cooperatives, I really see a future for um, an ideal partnership. And um, you know, we really are looking at food deserts and, and how we get wholesome food to our veterans and, and those community partnerships. So I'm very excited to hear. I, I'm very excited to be involved. Um, and then also we have a substance prime vendor contract and I can put that in the link, but that's that's where we have our food contracts. And um, there's 168 medical centers who um, use this contract, 187 canteen services and many other agencies. And so um, that's a, a great place for um, individuals to go and get some information about that contract. Great, thank you for sharing. Um, Another person I want to touch base with and see if they have anything that they would like to add or any resources available for cooperatives would be Ginger Allen from SBA. Ginger, are you on? I am on. I was just having trigger finger on my microphone, so it's no on problem. and off. Anyway, sorry about that, guys. Um, hi there uh, to all my former USDA colleagues. Uh, I was at USDA Business and Industry for a number of years and uh, recognize still a whole bunch of you. Um, so hi. Um, yes, I'm at the chief of the 7A Loan Policy Division here at Small Business Administration, and we offer guaranteed commercial loans, and certainly we can do that for cooperatives. One thing to keep in mind for uh, an SBA 7A uh, loan, though, is that we do require a personal guarantee from at least one person. Um, and we find that sometimes it's a bit difficult for a cooperative. 
Um, who knows what the future brings in terms of policy changes regarding that one in particular, but that is our policy at the moment. Check us out. We do have um, a function we call Lender Match, where you can uh, just Google it, SBA Lender Match. And if you've got someone who's looking for a guaranteed loan, um, we can connect them with a great SBA lender through that facility. Okay. Um, thanks, Ginger. Uh, I do want to men to uh, give possibly Frank Satera a chance to um, talk if he had anything to add to the conversation about cooperatives and federal programs that are out there. Are you on, Frank? Um, I'm, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Hi, I'm, I'm at home today, so I'm not on video either, uh, kind, of, kind of in and out, but um, glad to be able to check in and happy that uh, we are able to continue to work towards uh, developing the uh, awareness and skill set of our SBDC advisors um, across America's SBDC network uh, to assist cooperatives and spreading the word about the 7A loan program, trying to get some co-op 7a loans in the pipeline so to speak so that we can work towards um, perhaps showing the need for that policy change um, because it is very much a challenge for anybody to need to bring in a personal guarantee as one member of a multi-member cooperative and take all that on their shoulders it's just not fair and um, it's just holding back um, potentially these these types of loans so appreciate the sba uh, still uh, considering that need and working towards uh, um, you know, reviewing that policy and trying to change that policy over time. And we'll keep working with our small businesses to develop their, their business plans and, and develop their skill sets um, to be the most successful uh, co-ops that they can be. Uh, ASBDC National Conference this September 6th through 9th in San Diego, California. If you're there, look me up. We're having our first national meeting in person of the uh, uh, business transition uh, and employee ownership uh, special interest section for the ASBDC network. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I think at this point, I've run through a lot of the folks that um, have wanted to say something. We'll open up wide to our guests and non-federal agencies if you want to jump in or have any questions or comments. Ron? Yes, hi. hi. I, I was I was really excited to hear the shout out for the Allegheny uh, Allegheny grass fed beef co-op. <laughs> with, um, with KDC, we've been assisting them along the way with um, organization business planning, and um, I just also we I'm, we would really like to show our appreciation for all the uh, for the interagency efforts. And uh, because there's just so many resources that we can use, and um, it looks like some streamlining effort is is coming along too, and that's just going to be fantastic. So everybody have a good day and weekend. Thank you. You too. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, I guess with that, uh, Megan, I'll turn it back over to you. I want to say thank you to everybody for participating today, and um, we'll be taking the information and the links and putting those together and adding those to the interagency working group PDF and put those up on the website so you'll have access to those. Um, Megan, I believe we, we have Melissa hey. Hoover that would oh, like to speak. I apologize, Melissa. Go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't want to keep folks from from leaving. So, and I I unfortunately had to miss the first half hour um, of the of the call. So, if this has already been addressed, just let me know. I had a couple kind of complexifying questions uh, about the cooperative form and and rural business in in, in food systems. One was whether um, conversions of existing small businesses, you know, in the face of owner retirement um, conversions to cooperatives are part of the thinking here. I know there's a whole other working group about that, but wondering if that has been part of the model. And relatedly, one of the things we're seeing, particularly in food systems businesses that are where there's a retiring owner um, and no buyer is sort of this multi-stakeholder cooperative approach where there's community ownership and maybe worker ownership or various different kinds of, you know, sometimes very complex um, structures. And I'm wondering if any of the 
um, projects or agencies have um, have have worked on either conversions or multi-stakeholder co-ops or both. Maybe Margaret would want to answer that. <laughs> well, I was just speaking with uh, Kelly Maynard, if she's still on the line with the University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives, and she is working on a project right now in food processing that will involve both producers and workers, a multi-stakeholder cooperative. And I, Kelly may have dropped off uh, the line. Yeah. Or maybe but, it's uh, just a request to like document some of these experiments and share them out so that we sure. can standardize because they're all so, you know, unique. Right. Yeah, this is Jim. This is Jim Wadsworth. Uh, you know, in, in, in the ag sector, we had some conversions uh, from from private sector to cooperative. Uh, the biggest one that we've done uh, reports on it was uh, is uh, the, the turkey poultry processing cooperative down in Rockingham, Virginia, uh, that had been owned by Pilgrim's Pride. They decided to close a plant and uh, and let, left a bunch 150 turkey producers without a market or a place to take their birds. And those producers got together and with you with CoBank funds and Rural development funds uh, formed a cooperative, and what what was interesting about that whole whole thing is that it had been a cooperative in the 80s. Then it was sold to a private company, and then it was sold to Pilgrim's Pride, and then it became a cooperative again. But there's a case study uh, in a book actually that I helped write on, on that. But we don't see it so much in in ag unless it's going from uh, non-co-op to co-op and that happens sometimes it's a it's a very difficult thing to do that cooperative continues to do really well one thing i wanted to, to say that uh, at the end of this and i get know we're getting close is uh, one thing we do when we reach out to our farmer cooperatives with our survey uh, we have a direct link to them that is our direct <laughs> network with with co-ops as i share our programs especially the, you know the uh American Rescue Plan Act, the food supply chain information. And I, one thing I am going to put in my email and elsewhere, once we have the uh, interagency working group website beefed up, uh, a link to that too. So so our cooperatives will know what programs are out there, not just within USDA too. So, but sorry to jump in, but anyone else wanted to uh, talk about Melissa's issue, Ken? Thanks. I think there are several meat processing um, cooperatives opening up in maybe North Carolina. Um, I don't know if those are conversions, though. They might be starting up from scratch. Yeah, I think yeah. those are producer ones starting from scratch. There's one up in uh, Washington on the on the, I, the island. I can't remember the name of the island, but it's right off the coast of Washington uh, that started up as a producer owned cooperative to market and now they're moving into food process or into processing their animals. So there's that's one example. And then there's another in California that's been doing it for quite a while. But the the key to remember there is they're doing it because there is no other option. Um, you know, and that's that's really what's going to make that work in the case of processing because the the margins are really, really tight and you're not going to compete on margin. So it has to be something that you're doing because there's no other choice. Or at least in the food in the processing side of things. Now, from a worker conversion, there there's some opportunities there. Um, Megan, thoughts? Well, I was hoping that maybe some other folks have questions that they'd want to ask of of some of the government representatives. Very quiet crowd. This is Jim again. Uh, sorry, Megan. Uh, just one other thing. Uh, one thing I hope comes out of this is I know a lot about ag co-ops, but I don't know so much about the other models. Of course, I have some experts on my staff, which is in our team that, are, that know some of the other models, especially Margaret, Debbie, and, and Megan. Uh, uh, but one thing that I've learned from, and I hope that we can take these models and shift them to different areas. Uh, a number of years ago, Bruce Reynolds and I, who's he's long retired, but we had a group of farm supply cooperatives come to us uh, wanting to form a purchasing cooperative. So we went and we got in contact with NCBA and they said, go across the river in Maryland and meet with IMARC, 
Group, which is a purchasing cooperative for electrical supplies and plumbing and other things, sheetrock, I think. But anyway, we went and sat with the CEO there for over an hour and had a great discussion. And he provided us such terrific information on uh, it wasn't any comp competition to him. So he was willing to share the whole story. And we took that back to these uh, farm supply co-ops in Arkansas in the Mid-South. And there were only five of them together. They formed this purchasing cooperative where they didn't want a whole another federated cooperative. They had been part of Farmland Industries, which went bankrupt and they lost a lot of money. So, they, But they wanted to jointly purchase some goods. And today they're up to 19 uh, uh, other farm supply cooperatives in, in purchasing a number of things with the model that we learned from iMark and, and thanks to our NCBA connection. So that's just the hope for me. And I'll I'll stop there. Thanks. You know, um, I see that um, Ginger Allen from SBA was asking um, about the needs of cooperatives and how all of us at federal agencies can better assist cooperatives. Does anybody want to um, jump in to answer that? I, I have a, a heretical thing to say, maybe. Um, which is that, you know, for SBA forever, you know, cooperatives have, um, and you mentioned this, the, the personal guarantee issue and sort of, we've said, oh, you know, you, um, we've got to like figure out a way to remove the personal guarantee or change the personal guarantee. And I think increasingly, this is why it, it's, it's heretical. Cause I know that that has been some of the effort has been to ask the SBA to, to change that, but, um, in the field, in, increasingly, I think we're thinking, well, okay, how do we work with that? You know, how, how do we maybe, uh, instead of trying to change, instead of trying to get the SBA to come to us, <laughs> like a, you know, a, a battleship to a canoe, um, go to the SBA and say, you know, we may have these other ways of meeting personal guarantee requirements or leveraging private capital for personal guarantees. I guess I'm just sort of thinking that there has to be some creative thinking around um, the personal guarantee issue for cooperatives because um, I just don't, it doesn't seem likely to me that that is, is going to change or until we reach maybe a certain scale where it's, it's worth having the discussion. Um, and so I'm sort of interested in, in how the agencies see the relationship between public and private um, capital in terms of like some of those more creative ways of, of building a capital stack for um, for financing. Big question. Hi, this is Frank uh, with SBDC. I've got my hand up if it's okay to go right now. Um, so first of all, uh, in terms of the capital stack, uh, just as with the general population, most SBDC advisors at this time are unfamiliar with the options uh, that a cooperative can uh, utilize in, in this regard. So it's up to us to to a degree to start, you know, continually develop the uh, awareness and the ability of our SBDC advisors to recognize uh, those those opportunities that are out there. Uh, we do have um, also a limited bandwidth in terms of reaching folks in a rural economy um, who are food related uh, e economy folks and one of the reasons for that is just because of our um, sort of our decentralized centralized system right i mean if we're located at a, a community college or a suny school system that um is you know located at the center of a geographically populous area like here in syracuse we cover six counties right um we're located in syracuse Naga county we cover six counties though and most of those other counties are rural um but we only have the capacity to sort of get out to them uh, you know, once a week or once every other week or, or something along those lines. So I know that, you know, CDCs fill in some of those gaps in, 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 the, in the rural areas, but uh, regardless, there's still not complete coverage. And then the third thing that I would say that uh, what, what co-ops need is very similar to what other businesses need and that they need, you know, good uh, business development and, and understanding and analysis skills and so on and so forth. But what communities need um, from some recent recent research that I've seen come out of the UK and maybe there's similar research here in the US is that um, there needs to be a cultural understanding and a cultural uh, educational component, uh, not just within the business world, but within the general population as well to be aware of and 
connected to the, the co-op movement. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a way, you know, through federal or state agencies that, you know, things such as PSAs um, could, could help contribute to that. Um, if, if I might jump in with one point, this is Ginger Allen with the SBA again, and I apologize uh, to, to, to ask the question and then go, oh, I've got to go. Um, but I do have a 2.30 call I have to get on. I, I think um, maybe I need to clarify that uh, October 1st of 2020, when we issued our most recent uh, uh, SOP 5010-6, we did clarify that the personal guarantee can be from an entity for co-ops. Um, and that was something that we made um, for co-ops only. Um, so we still require a guarantee, but for co-ops, we did relax the rules there and said, okay, it can come from an entity rather than from a human. So I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. And Debbie, I can see you're trying to talk, but. No, I just, I want to say thank you. It's, that's good to know. I'm sorry, I have a cicada out my window, so I'm trying to keep that to a minimum. Any, Frank, you have additional oh, comments? Sorry, my hand is supposed to be down, but just to say in regards to that person, that, that guarantee from an entity as opposed to a personal person, I'm, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know if that's how the, 7A loan to a food co-op in Virginia worked because they did a really strong um, membership campaign uh, to get that food co-op started. And potentially that was a part of what went towards the, the, the person, went towards the guarantee to enable that 7A loan. That's more of a collateralized guarantee by, by doing that? We should we should we should look at the details. Okay, <laughs> I think that would be interesting to know because it would be helpful for others if we, if we get that sorted. Any other final parting comments from anyone? Okay, we have run a little bit over, but I did want to thank everybody for uh, taking the time out of your day and joining us. And Megan, do you want to talk about the next? meeting for the next um, meeting sure next um friday we're going to have a, a meeting um on cooperatives and the environment so some of the issues overlap with the food committee and then the following friday which is august 5th um we'll have a meeting on cooperative conversions um but i i did want to give the opportunity to um dr neil to speak if she's still on She actually may have had to to leave, um, but uh, I, I just want to thank everybody so much for attending. And I think this has been uh, a really uh, fertile uh, exchange of ideas and and resources. And I, I hope you know that's what the interagency working group is all about: is to continue to to reach out across the federal government to um, pull these things you know together so that we're all. Um, working together. So thank you so much um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and, and your weekend. Thank you.